I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Wednesday night uh, Bible class. We're currently engaged in a study of uh, the book of Romans. And we'll start this week at uh, Romans 11th chapter, verse 24. Before we do, though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can gather in this medium to study thy word. And we're thankful for thy word, for the guidance that provides us, for the hope that we have in it. And that is, it is a means of salvation, not only to us, but to all the world. And we pray, Father, that thy word may be proclaimed throughout the world, that those who are lost may respond to its call. And bless us as we continue the study. May we be prepared always to proclaim thy word to the lost and dying world. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right, if you recall, uh, Paul was talking about trees, olive trees in particular, and about the branches that were being uh, cut out of it, and then branches that grafted in. And so. He's using this as a, an allegory, uh, an allusion to both the Jews and the uh, Gentiles. So he says in 24, verse 24, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and I must admit, I don't know anything about olive trees, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. Like I say, I don't, I don't know anything about olive trees or grafting or anything else, but I know a lot of it's cutting branches. But anyways, he is, he's just really, uh, the Gentiles are described as the uh, wild olive tree because uh, they hadn't enjoyed the advantages of Israel. That's uh, Israel was God's chosen nation from which the uh, Christ was going to come. And the Gentiles were converted from idolatry and, and ignorance. Uh, that is, the wild olive tree. And they uh, were received into the church of the saved. And that's the cultivated olive tree. A wild branch is then benefited by being grafted into a cultivated olive tree. Uh, the Gentile is blessed by becoming a, a member of the church. Now, if this is the case with the Gentile, how much uh, more so with the unbelieving Jew? That's the natural branches. If they were grafted into their own olive tree after belief. The Gentile was converted out of idolatry. The Jew wasn't. Because of the tremendous advantages they had over the Gentiles, they should have never been cut off from their olive tree, but were because of unbelief. It is based on belief that they can be grafted in once again. Verse 25, for, and keep in mind uh, for is a connective word, uh, it connects uh, with what has just been said in verses 1 through 24. He said, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness, or as ASV uh, words it, a hardening, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, mystery does not mean that which is unknowable but knowledge that must be revealed or explained by revelation from God. It has been concealed and is now to be revealed. God wanted the Gentiles to understand the condition of the Jews. Yet the condition of fleshly Israel is a mystery. If the Gentiles understood this mystery, it would prevent a haughty spirit. This, in the, the phrase, this mystery, this refers to what has been discussed in the preceding 24 verses. 
included in this mystery, quote unquote, this mystery, is this verse 25 that we're uh, in right now and the following 26th verse. Now verses 25 and 26 are explaining verses 1 through 24. In what has been has preceded the connective for in verses 25, uh, and we look at uh, the verses 7 through 10, we see that the Jews, exclusive, exclusive of the remnant, were hardened. They hardened themselves. And this far, you know, connects uh, with uh, verses 11 through 14. And we see there that by the fall of the Jews, salvation of the Gentiles was hastened. In verses 15 through 24, we see that the salvation of Israel was possible. Israel was broken off except for the remnant. But if they would obey Christ, they could be grafted back into God's favor. Paul says that Israel uh, had been blinded or hardened, if you will, in part, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, it's assumed by some that the fullness of the Gentiles means that all Gentiles would be finally converted to Christ, which will be followed by the conversion to Christ of the whole Jewish race. Now, to assert such is to ignore the fact that all Gentiles and Jews can be converted right now. They can have done so when these words were penned. They can do it today. Nothing prevents them from doing so except their own rebellious will. And God has never overridden one's will or saved them regardless of their rebellion. Uh, some future kingdom advocates uh, interpret the fullness of the Gentiles as the full count of the Gentiles. Um, and that's uh, kind of when the, the Lord has gathered out of the Gentiles the uh, full number he wants for rulers in the supposed future kingdom. Then evangelism among them will cease, and the Jews will then turn to Christ. Now, the, these are just assumptions, of course, and they, they don't have any logical basis to them. It is assumed uh, that the proposition until uh, does not tell what will follow the event or events mentioned in the phrase it introduces or governs. Now, that's a, that's a false uh, proposition, false assumption, uh, because a lot of times there seem to be finality of uh, what the Bible says, but, but it really isn't. And we can uh, give a few examples here. In uh, Genesis 8, chapter verse 5, it reads there, and the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Nothing is said about the 11th month. Well, uh, you know, this does not indicate any change after the 10th. No 11th month is mentioned. But the record shows that the waters continue to decrease for some time afterwards. So something did happen in the 11th month and 12th, maybe even further. <clears throat> in John 5th chapter verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Well, this is to say that uh, the Father was only working until now and then quit. Uh, is he no longer working? Well, we can't say that. That'd be a ridiculous proposition. In verse, in chapter uh, Romans 8, uh, chapter tw uh, verse 22, he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth, Pains together until now. Well, can one say with certainty that such ceased at the time of Paul's writing? Well, you, you can't do that either. 
So, you know, you can't be conclusive about, uh, you know, the fullness of the Gentiles. It's uh, things happen after the things were written. <clears throat> and uh, Romans 11, chapter verse 26, it reads, and so, and the end so just means uh, thusly in this manner, in this way, uh, it, it refers to either what precedes or what follows, or maybe both. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now this quote is from Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verses 21 and 20, uh, 20 and 21, and it reads there, uh, the Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression. And Jacob, says the Lord, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, uh, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants, descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Now the saying that, quote unquote, all Israel will be saved, does not mean that all the Jews shall eventually be saved. In Romans the ninth chapter, verse, uh, verses 2 and 3, which we've already covered, Paul wrote, uh, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. Now, if Paul knew that all the Jews would be uh, would finally be saved, why does he express this sorrow? In Romans the tenth chapter, verse one, he wrote, "Brethren, my heart's desire." And prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Well, why did he have this anxiety if he knew that all the Jews would be saved? The so, quote unquote, so that begins this verse is an adverb signifying after this manner. <clears throat> Therefore, it is saying that all Israel, if they are saved at all, will be saved in the manner set forth in verses 15 through 24. If they were to give up their unbelief, they could be grafted back into God's favor. The quote-unquote rest that could be saved in the same manner as a quote-unquote remnant. Paul briefly wrote in uh, Romans the ninth chapter verses 6 and 7, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they, are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed uh, shall be called. And again in Romans the second chapter, verses 28 and 29, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and in circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Peter said, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they, Acts 15, chapter verse 11. Peter was saying that the Jew would be saved in the same manner and on the same basis as the Gentile and vice versa. So all Israel, quote unquote, means all who believe in Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile. All will be saved in the same manner or lost in the same manner. The unbelieving Jew ceased to be counted in the phrase all Israel. The unbelieving Gentile was never included. The Redeemer, that is Jesus Christ, shall turn away uh, godliness and godliness from Jacob. 
Jesus would make salvation possible for the Jews, the descendants of Jacob. In the 27th verse of uh, chapter 11, it reads, For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As stated in the Isaiah passage just read, Jesus the Deliverer will take away their sins if they will but accept him and turn away from their ungodliness. And this is the covenant with him. It is also the covenant with the Gentile, with all mankind. In verse 28, it says, Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are blood for the sake of the fathers. If the church were strictly a Jewish institution, the Jews would not have exhibited such animosity towards it. Because the gospel appealed to the Gentile also, and they accepted it, the Jews in large part opposed it. It was not because the Jews could not understand the gospel, they did. They knew that in their present condition of unbelief that the gospel condemned them. And they could not tolerate being treated by the gospel as equals with the Gentiles. No respectable Pharisee would think of becoming a member of an institution made up largely of Gentiles. Recall that when uh, Paul told the Jews in Jerusalem that the Lord had told him to depart from them, that's the Jews, and go and preach to the Gentiles, they said to him, Away with such a fellow from the earth. He is not fit to live. Therefore, because of the Gentile Christians, the Jews were enemies of the gospel. Nothing compelled them to be such except their own disposition towards the gospel. God had selected their fathers in the flesh, that is, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as the line through which the Christ would come, and he had not disavowed that selection. Even though these descendants had so sinned as to be broken off from his uh, favor, they were still beloved on account of the fathers and not on their own account. In verse 29, it reads, uh, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And King James says, uh, are without repentance. And the ASV says, not repented of. And this confirms the last clause of verse 28. The word irrevocable, while true of God's gift and, and calling, is not a good translation of the Greek, uh, at least in my opinion. You know, I am a Greek uh, expert. <clears throat> Even the translation without repentance is uh, lacking. Now, if taken from the complete word study uh, dictionary, which I have online, uh, that word that's translated irrevocable it means uh, without uh, to change one's mind without repentance or it's used in regard to the gifts and calling of God into salvation. Now the translation uh, without uh, repentance is very inadequate. This is according to the Greek word study. It would have been better translated without regret. Uh, what the apostle is saying here is that when God has given gifts to men and has extended his salvation to them, he never regrets the extension of his grace or changes his mind as having made a mistake because of the behavior of the ones that he saved and gifted. Uh, salvation should never be considered as merely man's decision to follow Christ, but also God's acceptance of the genuineness of that decision and the birth and existence of faith. 
yeah, still continuing with this uh, definition of in the Plague Word Study Dictionary. God chose Abraham and the other Jewish fathers and bestowed of them many great and special favors. The choosing and bestowal of the favors are still not regretted. God's mind is unaltered and unalterable. He does not regret anything he has done. His mind is therefore unaltered in regard to covenants and promises made to Abraham and the Jewish fathers. He will yet be a God to the rejected Jews whom he still loves, not because of them, but because of their fathers. When these Jews become obedient to a son, he will bless them with salvation. Thus he will do only when they abandon their unbelief. Now let's look at the uh, Calvinist interpretation of this verse. Uh, the Calvinist interprets this verse as follows. Uh, when God purposes to call in favor of people, his purpose is unalterable. Since he long ago purposed to call in favor of Israel, he will yet certainly do it. It is true that when God purposes unconditionally to call people, he will certainly call them. However, he purposes unconditionally nothing more than the call. He never unconditionally uh, purposes salvation by dictat. Uh, he, uh, seek, this he confers only on condition of obedience to Christ. He has already called the Jews by the gospel and is still calling them. He has done the same for the Gentiles. His purpose then has been executed. Uh, whether he will favor them with salvation depends on their own voluntary acceptance of Christ and on no other basis. Uh, this is not the Calvinist interpretation of the verse, but uh, quite frankly, I don't know where that was. Uh, I think it was a previous paragraph uh, to this one. In verse 30, this reads, For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. And of course, it continues on in verse uh, 31. Even so, these also have uh, now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they may also obtain mercy. So back in uh, verse 30, the once was that period prior to their conversion. They have uh, now obtained mercy through the preaching of the gospel and their obedience to it. It was through the disobedience of the Jews, uh, namely their rejection of the gospel, that the efforts of Paul and other apostles were directed to the Gentiles. The more the Gentiles heard the gospel, the more of them that obeyed it. The percentage of Jews in the church became smaller and smaller. And therefore, their corrupting influence, Judaizing teachers, waned uh, significantly over the years. In verse uh, 31, it says, Even so, these who have uh, now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they, they uh, may also obtain mercy this continuation of verse 30. So those uh, uh, disobedient God were not believing in his son. Now, formerly the Jews were obedient to the gospel and Paul is saying you Gentiles were disobedient. It's uh, now reversed. The Jews now could be shown the mercy shown the Gentiles by the hand of the Gentiles. As the rejection of the Jews proved a blessing to the Gentiles, and now the reception of the Gentiles is to prove a blessing to the Jews. In spreading the gospel, the Gentile can now preach to the Jews and induce them to obey the gospel. The gospel first came from the Jews, the apostles were Jews, Christ was a Jew, and so forth. 
uh, the gospel first came from the Jews to the Gentiles. And now the gospel will come from the Gentiles to the Jews. Thus the Jews are to obtain mercy through the mercy first shown to the Gentiles. In verse 32, for God has committed, uh, King James says concluded, and the ASV says uh, hath shut up. So for God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Again, I go back to the complete word study. Uh, this word committed means to enclose together. Uh, figuratively is to include together, to deliver over in the same manner. Uh, when it's used with ice, uh, E-I-S, uh, it means unto. And uh, that's the way it's used here in Romans 11, uh, 32nd verse. Unto, where Paul speaks of Israel, uh, who as a nation, uh, manifested unbelief in Christ as the Messiah. Uh, this speaks of God's omniscience. He knew the reaction of Israel, yet he came to his people first, but his people did not receive him. This did not constitute a surprise to the Lord. It says that uh, Romans 11, chapter verse 32, the one that we're in, Ought to be viewed with uh, 11:26, which will, uh, or which we've already covered, where the de declaration is made that all Israel shall be saved. As in verse 32, where we have a prophecy which was fulfilled in view of Israel's attitude toward the Lord Jesus in 11:26, we have a yet unfulfilled prediction of Israel's attitude when the Lord shall come again, and they shall say. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The meaning here is that, again, this is still the word study. The meaning here is that uh, to all those who were imprisoned in unbelief, there has been offered the promise of Christ's mercy and salvation. Uh, there is no intimation here of universal salvation. The same offer of salvation that was made to all Israel was also made to all nations, as we see in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verses 12 through 25. And again, we're still in the uh, uh, word study with hupo, uh, that's a Greek word, under, means under, in Galatians 3.22, the scripture hath included all under sin means that sin affected everything jew gentiles and nature itself romans 8 chapter 8 chapter verses 19 to 22. romans 8 chapter verses 23 indicates that god's first provision against the, uh, this total subjugation under sin was a law but it was not a permanent arrangement it was only till such time as faith in the lord jesus christ would be revealed and he gives various verses to support that. This does not mean that God has shut up all, both Jew and Gentile, under conditions that they had to be disobedient. But he counted all as disobedient. As Paul wrote earlier in Romans, the third chapter, verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. For this reason, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, chapter verses 30 and 31. Christ came to save sinners, not to cause men to be sinners. People are not made sinners by hearing the gospel. They are already sinners. That is, that is why the gospel is preached to them. It is God's power for salvation for one who is already lost. <clears throat> Romans, the 11th chapter, verse 33. <clears throat> it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable 
or his judgments. And that's the Greek word prima, which means judgment given a decision, uh, an award or a sentence. How in search for his judgments and his ways past to finding out. Uh, when it uses the word depth, that means uh, profundity. Uh, that's an inexhaustible and uncertain fullness. Riches means abundance, uh, richness. It's a valuable uh, bestowment. So the depth of the riches of God refers to the unlimited, inexhaustible resources at the command of God, and especially with reference to his working out the plan for man's redemption. Wisdom is from the Greek word Sophia, which means uh, infant skill, insight, knowledge, purity. And knowledge is from the Greek word gnosis. So when sophis and gnosis are used together, gnosis refers to knowledge regarded by itself, whereas sophia refers to knowledge exhibited in action that is the proper application of knowledge taken together the depth of riches uh, denotes the infinite resources that god has and is to uh, command to effect the salvation of the world now wisdom directs or adapts these resources to the accomplishment of the desired end while knowledge comprehends the hold of the resources and the end and supplies material to the wisdom accordingly or to the wisdom accordingly if the jews reject christ uh, such are the divine resources that the rejection is made to contribute to the salvation of the gentiles if the gentiles obey this again is made subservient to the salvation of the jews Thus, the depth of the riches, uh, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, are made conducive to that one great end, the salvation of man. This, uh, the knowledge of God does not refer uh, to what God knows, but uh, to what is known or may be known about him and his plans which can only come to man by revelation. Now, Paul's prayer for knowledge is recorded in Colossians, the first chapter, verses 9 through 10. It reads there, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and that uh, ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, the, the apostle Peter exhorted his readers in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. No one can know the mind of God unless he reveals it. Now, Paul wrote uh, that which is recorded in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verses 9 through 13. But as it is, as, is, it is, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man, man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, and, and uh, I think maybe King James says spiritual things with spiritual words, or the ASV. <clears throat> uh, some 
did not even have the knowledge that had been revealed. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. How unsearchable are his judgments. And I see it's the uh, bottom of the hour, so we'll stop here and we'll begin with verse 34 of chapter 11 next week. Thank you.